Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope I am audible. I think I am having some internet issues, but I think I am finally online. Uh, if you can just confirm if I am audible, we can begin. All right, perfect. Uh, thanks, Priyanka. So, uh, so what we are going to talk about today uh, is an area of law which is essentially the most disruptive uh in terms of the entire methodology of carrying out civil litigation in our country for the past several decades uh what we are talking about is the commercial courts act and the specialized adjudicatory mechanism it puts in place qua the adjudication of civil suits now uh originally the way the commercial courts act was planned was to actually have a very niche or a very curated a uh, system for the adjudication of commercial disputes uh, the identification of which disputes was to be done in very narrow terms and also subject to a high threshold in terms of the uh, amount involved which would essentially have meant that only a very few number of disputes or uh, in comparison say to the overall uh, number of cases which were pending in the civil system a very small uh, proportion of those claims would have actually uh, gone before a commercial court but the reason why i now want to deal with the commercial courts act in the context of our overall seminar is that uh, divorced from uh, its origins as being intended as a sort of an elite system of adjudication for specified disputes because of various reasons uh, including the allegation that the system that was sought to be put in place was completely out of bounds for the common litigant and was intended as some sort of a fast track process uh intended uh, purely for uh, corporates at the expense of the general public uh, parliament made a couple of radical changes to the original design of the commercial courts act in the form of one the uh, identification of a dispute so without going into great detail if you take a look at the subject provisions of the commercial courts act which define what is a commercial dispute you will find an extremely wide interpretation which basically brings in almost all kinds of uh, transactional or contractual disputes between parties within the rubric of a commercial dispute so maybe leaving aside uh, properties which are intended for residential purposes family disputes in the sense of partition etc pretty much every contemporary dispute which you can imagine in the marketplace falls within the rubric of the definition of a commercial dispute number 2 as opposed to the high threshold in terms of the of the pecuniary value which was originally contemplated in the crores uh once again uh, there is a backtrack in the sense that now the pecuniary value has been fixed at a very low threshold of rupees 3 lakhs which is really nothing when it comes to the size of contemporaneous disputes so please bear in mind that the commercial courts act uh, far from being intended as a very niche forum for adjudication of disputes has now uh, developed and sort of uh, stretched its wings to cover a very large area or a cover a very large number of the disputes which inevitably end up before the civil courts so therefore with this uh, in mind it is very important to understand the kind of challenges which advocates will face or lawyers will face when they are confronted with the provisions of the commercial courts act and therefore for any person interested in civil litigation uh understanding the commercial courts act and what it brings to the table is really a sine qua non uh, in terms of the future practice uh, uh, the future uh, practice potential now uh, the reason why the commercial courts act marks such a significant departure from what we are used to is because it actually attempts to uh, if i may call it that uh, invoke some sort of a shock therapy and bring about a complete cultural shift in the way litigation is done in the country so as opposed to say you know those uh, or on and off amendments which come to the cpc every now and then those let's say changes which are more in the nature of say an evolution of the process uh, in many many in many significant ways the commercial courts act is quite disruptive in the sense that it completely overturns what is the established practice and procedure on uh, many levels and uh, makes it this that much more harder to be able to either maintain a suit or to be able to maintain a defense and even the smallest of mistakes are now punished significantly uh, unlike in the earlier case where almost every infraction in the majority of provisions under the cpc was something condonable on an appropriate application being made before the court 
so for both these reasons one how easy it is to suffer an adverse order under the commercial courts act just because you were not aware of the procedure as also the fact that the act will now cover a huge number of disputes it is imperative that we consider uh, this act and what exactly it contemplates in terms of these changes now with that introduction in mind uh, i have already shared with you a reading which gives you a very broad overview of the context and background of the commercial courts act so please go through it for a fuller understanding of how exactly the act came about and what were the areas which it's actually sought to address in terms of rectification of what were the ills which actually uh, plagued the system so i'm not getting into that because there is a lot to cover in terms of what the act brings in on a practical level so i will read, read that to you uh, in terms of a general reading later now what we are precisely concerned with today is uh, what exactly the act actually uh, changes on the ground level for that i had shared with all of you this powerpoint which i will now be referring to uh, which actually brings out what are these changes in a simple and brief fashion now uh, as i already mentioned to you uh, see the commercial courts act if you look at the background etc it's actually a specialized ecosystem it's a very enlarged ecosystem because of the changes i mentioned as compared to how it was originally conceptualized but be that as it may it remains a specialized ecosystem and it is a complete code in itself what this means is what the act tells you is what is applicable irrespective of say ancillary statutes or provisions which may operate say the cpc etc now uh, also the courts have already taken a view that uh, the provisions of the act are to be construed very strictly because if they are construed liberally then we pr pretty much go back to status quo in the sense of almost every let's say default being condonable and ultimately not being able to achieve the ultimate aim of say a faster and more effective adjudication process so the commercial courts act is geared towards faster effective and more uh, more professional uh, methodology of adjudication of disputes in our civil courts now uh, one important aspect right off the bat which you must remember whenever you are instituting a uh, uh, let's say commercial suit is under the commercial courts act there is mandatory pre institution mediation so what this means is let's say you want to file a case suit for recovery let's go back to a versus b now a versus b let's take it is a commercial dispute a wants to sue b now it has never before been ever a requirement to file a civil suit in this country that you must mandatorily attempt mediation it that's never been the rule but the commercial courts act enshrines a mandatory provision that prior to filing a rule uh, file, prior to filing the commercial suit you must attempt mediation with the other side and if that mediation fails say within a particular period of time only then are you permitted to go ahead and file a civil suit so this is very very important to understand because a lot you'll see hundreds of cases where suits are filed and an objection is taken saying that, that the mandatory pre institution mediation was never resorted to le leaving the suit non maintainable now please bear in mind there is a petition challenging the constitutional validity of the pre institution mediation provisions which is currently pending before the high court of delhi i believe but uh, there is no stay thereof and therefore today this is essentially what you are expected to take a look at now the only exception to this rule is if your suit is requesting for a, a injun a specific and urgent injunction let's say you are filing a specific performance suit uh you are of the fear, you are of the worry or the anxiety that the counterparty is trying to dispose of its assets for instance dispose of the property which is actually subject matter of the suit in such a situation you can bypass the pre institution mediation and directly move court if your suit is one which is seeking an urgent relief so that exception of course is available but in a simple set of suit where there is no urgent interim relief which is sought for your suit will be non maintainable if you don't opt for pre institution mediation this is completely novel is never existed before in the civil litigation firmament in our country now uh, also please bear in mind that uh, once again section 8 of the act further tightens the avenues for recourse to challenge now section 13 of the commercial courts act specifically provides for the appellate remedies now uh, this has been construed under section 8 to mean further that no revision 
or no sort of interlocutory application is available to try and challenge such an order, which may be passed under the act and which is otherwise not appealable under section 13. As we dealt with during our class on the appellate mechanisms, you know, aside from a straightforward appeal, there are other mechanisms also available like revisional jurisdiction, etc. But the Commercial Courts Act says nothing doing. It is only the appellate power under section 13, which can actually be utilized to try and challenge any such order. But do bear in mind, as we already mentioned uh, in that particular session, Article 227 jurisdiction as available to a high court ultimately remains the uh, a constitutional power. So that obviously is not if affected by uh, this provision of the Commercial Courts Act. There is now direct precedent on that from both the High Court of Rajasthan as also the High Court of Gujarat. Now, uh, under the under Section 13 of the Commercial Courts Act, do bear in mind that uh, it is only the appeals which are enumerated therein which will actually be susceptible to an appeal. And in fact, there is recent precedent, including from the Delhi High Court, which says that uh, even in the presence of such a provision, if the parent act, the substantive act under which the appeal is to be preferred, for instance, there is something to do with an arbitration petition. Then if the parent act itself does not permit an appeal, then section 13 by itself will not vest the power to actually originally file an appeal before the appellate forum. So what this essentially means is section 13 by itself is narrowly construed. It only permits appeals in a limited number of cases. And even the appeals qua which it is silent about, the high courts have now interpreted it to mean that in that silence, if the parent substantive act does not permit an appeal, then that silence will not by itself vest fresh jurisdiction in you under the Commercial Courts Act to further file an appeal. So the, the cumulative effect of these provisions is that there is now a very narrow right of appeal under the Commercial Courts Act. And the practical consequence of this is staggering. Imagine a civil suit being tried, let's say, before the High Court on the original side. There will be umpteen number of orders which were earlier appealable under, say, various provisions, say, under the LPA provision or under the specific statute which birthed the High Court in the first place, say, in the, in the case of the Delhi High Court, which appeals are now no longer maintainable because the matter is now under the rubric of the Commercial Courts Act. So they are now a large variety of orders which may be passed at an interlocutory stage in the suit, which are now not at all appealable and which you will now directly possibly try to have interfered with by the Supreme Court in exercise of Article 136 jurisdiction, which is by filing a special leave petition. This is a huge shift because every day we discover as practitioners, when briefs come to me under the Commercial Courts Act, every day you discover new kinds of orders which might significantly prejudice a party but are simply not appealable because the Commercial Courts Act takes that normative call to completely shut out the appeal in the interest of expediency. Now, whether this is too harsh, etc., of course, is a matter of discussion, but ultimately the law as it is, is exactly this. So that is something you need to be aware of. Now, uh, of course, there is there are certain nuances in the sense that as we already as we already read, sub appeal is a substantive right. So therefore, if this an appeal was available to you and the case was actually prior to when the Commercial Courts Act came, then that obviously that right of appeal will continue if the appeal was already pending. But uh, uh, if the suit is actually, you know, actually converted also, then also Section 13 of the Commercial Courts Act would not be said to be strictly applicable. This is basically the nuance of the provision which these uh, judgments actually deal with. Now, as I'd already mentioned to you under Section 13, any way, any which way it is narrowly uh, uh, textually articulated. And more importantly, uh, subsequently, the judgments of uh, the various courts have actually interpreted it, to, it, it in an even more strict sense. Now, to give you an example, one of the relics, if you may call it, of the erstwhile era of uh, appeals under civil suits is the principle laid down in Shah Babulal Khimji. Now, Shah Babulal Khimji was the Bible for any lawyer who wanted to articulate, say, a wider scope of uh, appellate jurisdiction before a court concerned, especially a court exercising original jurisdiction, a, 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 Delhi, a court, a high court exercising original jurisdiction, because Shah Babulal Khimji gave a wide, very wide interpretation of what the word order meant, which could then be appealed further before the uh, appellate forum in the case of a division bench in the high court. 
but uh, the initial precedent seemed to suggest uh, even under the commercial courts act that the test under shah babulal khimji would continue however uh, subsequent judgments have completely obliterated that possibility and uh, the, uh, the 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 standard law now is that uh, babulal khimji and its understanding its wide understanding of what constitutes an appealable order will not be applicable to the commercial courts ecosystem which will purely go by uh, the meaning of order and judgment under section 13 of the commercial courts act so whatever short window was available in terms of going back to the status quo is now also firmly shut and this again is very very crucial to understand uh, as a practitioner to give you an example let's say you are fighting a particular application before the single judge now at the back of your mind you must realize strategically that the whether the order which is going to be passed whether in your favor or against you is appealable before the division bench or not because that again is a way of you know taking a call in terms of how exactly you want to proceed and if you are the person who succeeded before the single judge then obviously it's very important for you to raise that maintainability argument before the division bench and have any prospective appeal knocked out on the very first day so purely from the purpose of strategy from the purpose of ensuring that uh, you have all the let's say tools available at your disposal to try and knock out an appeal at the outset this is something obviously which will be of uh, great use to you now uh, one important element also of course is that uh, this uh, provision this section this act also contemplates expressly for a transfer so what it essentially uh, contemplates is that if uh, there were suits which were filed prior to the commercial of the commercial uh, let's say creation of the commercial division or the commercial uh, suit of the commercial courts then uh, such suits will be transferred to that particular commercial court or commercial division pursuant to that suit having been identified as one which fell within the rubric of a commercial dispute so in addition to the extremely large number of cases that are expected to of course come about in the future even in terms of the existing case load there is a specific mandate to transfer the same before the uh, commercial division or the commercial court system as the case may be now uh, one important aspect also uh, to understand is that obviously the strict timelines which have been put in place by the commercial courts act will obviously can't be uh, applied without any nuance to a pending suit because naturally a lot of the timelines under the pending suit would have been contemplated by taking into account the erstwhile cpc provisions so therefore obviously that rigor cannot fully apply to a transferred suit so at least to that extent there is some relief in the sense of the existing suits now what why exactly is the commercial courts act such a transformative change which as i mentioned to you in the beginning the transformative change is that through its provision certain certain provisions like section 13 section 8 etc not only does it transcribe uh, does it proscribe internally avenues to say uh, extend proceedings or prolong proceedings through you know multiple appeals challenge procedures etc more importantly under the commercial courts act certain significant amendments are effected to the cpc as it stands today now if you remember throughout our course so far we had gone through different forms say how is an affidavit filed how do you verify pleadings etc etc now the commercial courts act reiterates those uh, let's say requirements but couches them in far more stricter terminology now uh, the commercial courts act puts in place specific requirements qua a variety of things that are to be done under the cpc and these specific requirements are under two heads one the manner in which such an action must be performed and number two the timeline within which the action must be performed these are the two broad heads now all of the amendments which i will now quickly run you guys through all of them will fall under these two heads either a far stricter requirement in terms of the formal process or a far stricter mandatory requirement in terms of the timeline which that particular process or filing must adhere to now at the outset uh, let's come to verification of pleadings now as i showed you earlier the affidavit which we have under the standard litigation is something which is relatively simple as we all saw it basically says 
that uh, you must uh, that the deponent will say yes i have gone through the pleading it is drafted by my lawyer under my instructions i stand by the same there is nothing false therein and and then the you know the verification is complete but in the commercial courts act please remember the verification of a pleading is by something which is called a statement of truth this is specifically applicable to an original suit when you file the suit in the first instance instead of a supporting affidavit you will be required to put in place something called a statement of truth now the statement of truth is something the format for which is available in the commercial courts act i'm not reproducing it here but that is much stricter than a standard affidavit which is filed under the uh, the normal civil court system so if you take a look at the statement of truth it's part of the act you will find a lot of requirements such as identifying specific paragraphs which you attest to on different basis you will find uh, averments therein saying that every relevant document which is subject matter of controversy has been annexed with that particular plaint or pleading and a variety of other requirements so the statement of truth uh, some people obviously say it is window dressing it doesn't really change much but it is a big shift textually at least in terms of what the earlier kind of verification affidavits were and what exactly is required under the new regime so please remember it's no longer a simpliciter affidavit it is now something termed as a statement of truth which is textually more comprehensive than a standard verification affidavit now uh, another thing which you have to remember timelines now under the commercial courts act you now have an outer limit of 120 days please remember there are a, like a sea of precedent already on the point that this period is unextendable under no circumstance whatsoever will you be given the right to file your written statement beyond a period of 120 days what the act contemplates is 90 days but of course there is a discretion to extend further up to 120 days but the minute you file it say on the 121st day or the 122nd day that's it your right is completely shut out and the court really does not have the discretion to extend it under any circumstances so very very important please bear in mind this now again going back to the formal requirements from the timeline requirement now in the written statement you are required to make very very categorical and specific denials see one of the problems with uh, a lot of written statements if any of you have done internships and possibly you may have seen a few of them under the civil system also it's become rampant that a written statement essentially is only a denial of what the plaint says so in multiple written statements you will find the only text in the written statement is it is denied abc it is denied abc so uh, essentially the written statement doesn't say anything except denying what the plaint says now this one problem is it is complete non application of mind and number 2 it also does not really let the court know what are the specific areas of controversy and what is the counter statement of facts of the defendant in fact i am doing an arbitration now before a retired uh, judge of the supreme court uh, who uh, it has been who was who started his practice sometime i believe in the 1940s and he tells me very interestingly once we were sitting for a hearing and he gave a very interesting anecdote which i must share with you about this litigation which was going on inter say uh, some brothers and uh, so one of the brothers in the plaint wrote that uh, uh, that the, the pla- that so and so was the father of the plaintiff and the father of the plaintiff uh, deceased and uh, has left for his heavenly abode so that's how mechanical the process became that the defendant who is also a brother his counsel drafted the written statement to say it is denied that so and so is the father of the plaintiff it is denied that the father of the plaintiff went to his heavenly abode you know completely nonsensical but that's that's unfortunately how mechanical it became that you have to deny literally everything under the sun which is possibly written in the plaint even if it is completely outrageous so now under the uh, commercial courts act as is mentioned in this slide here you have to give specific reasons for your denial and if you are denying a particular state of things the onus is also now on you to say what is the real counter version of events so to give you an example again going back to a versus b 
in a normal let's say litigation you would have seen maybe a written statement where a b would have responded to a's allegation about the contract by saying i deny that any contract was ever executed full stop that would have been the end of the story but under the commercial courts act you are duty bound to say why are you denying this so you have to say i deny that there was any such agreement full stop a draft was proposed by a which was which was uh, discussed between the parties but ultimately no final agreement was ever agreed to or entered into so therefore under the commercial courts act the lot of these different ones are provided for in the slide i'm not going through them one by one you are required to be very very specific in terms of your denial otherwise you are going to have a serious problem because the court may actually construe that limited denial or ineffective denial as some sort of an admission on your part and therefore completely wreck your defense the plaintiff will be immediately entitled to a decree against you now that's why it's very important to uh, be aware of what the written statement is required to be under the commercial courts act now also from a plaintiff's perspective this is another important aspect see in most plaints you will find the request or the prayer for interest is asked for in a very perfunctory manner you will find one line at the end saying the court is pray it is prayed that the honorable court may also award interest at at say 12% per annum full stop that's all that is pleaded in most suits but under the commercial courts act now you are required to put in place detailed averments even qua interest not only the rate but from the date from which it is being claimed the date to which it is being calculated the daily rate thereafter etc etc so please bear in mind if you are a plaintiff under the commercial courts act a simple or vague line saying please give me interest full stop will no longer suffice though it is otherwise taken for granted in the normal civil litigation also very very important change substantively disclosure discovery and inspection of documents uh, in a commercial uh, paradigm now uh, under uh, order 11 of the cpc there is a substitution and now if you see the disclosure discovery and inspection regime has been significantly strengthened now uh, the plaintiff is required to file a list of all documents so and so uh, which are relevant and which are actually germane to the adjudication of the dispute so unlike earlier where technically there was no requirement that the plaintiff must make a clean breast of all documents which are relevant now there is a specific onus and mandate to do so now uh, also do remember that under the commercial courts act the statement of truth also will require you to make a specific statement as i mentioned that all relevant documents stand filed by you now very very onerous task implemented by the commercial courts act if you look at take a look at sub rule 2 the list of documents shall specify whether the documents in the power so and so are original so and so so and so and will also require you to set in brief details of parties to each document mode of execution issuance and line of custody this is a very onerous requirement i'll tell you why in the normal civil suits what do you do in an index you simply write the description of the document agreement dated so and so between a and b full stop that's it but now when you file a commercial suit and you annex documents along with that you are required to give a detailed index explaining each of these elements and believe me if you are filing a large commercial suit or a large commercial petition say a section 34 under the arbitration act if the in cases where the documents run into 150 pages 200 pages the index itself is no less than a pleading because that is the amount of detail which you will have to find out to be able to actually uh, construct or draft a index in this light i mean you can just imagine imagine for each document out of 200 documents setting out these details in an index it is a very very onerous process and uh, you know if the index is not filed technically your suit is really in that sense defective so please bear in mind under uh, sub rule 2 3 and 4 all of these elements are required to be borne in mind by you even in the sense of let's say identifying your documents or filing them in a particular format now uh, also you are required to set out in the plaint if there are any documents which are in the possession of the respondent and which you are required to uh, actually uh, get 
possession of if you i mean in terms of uh, a better adjudication of the controversy going forward now this almost same rule is then engrafted for the written sub statement also and i'm not going into it again and again but please see from these particular rules which are mentioned in the slide identical requirements have been put in place for documents which are filed along with the written statement as well so i am not repeating what is the purpose what is the need etc but very similar requirements for filing the written statement also so even if you are appearing for a defendant please bear in mind these specialized and exacting requirements which the commercial courts act requires you to follow now again coming to inspection inspection is no longer now this wide open process which you can do at your whim and fancy uh, you have to complete inspection of all documents within a period of 30 days from the date of filing of the uh, documents and uh, you will also have to ensure that uh, if at all you need any such directions in case there is no inspection which is provided that you make a request in this regard before the court concerned within a particular period and now please see if the application is allowed then inspection and uh, copies thereof are to be provided within 5 days if you see the last rule so very very tight timelines extremely tight in the sense of ensuring that none of these stages actually you know go beyond what is actually uh, contemplated and that the trial therefore get doesn't get gridlocked as a result of the same now for admission denial also uh, very very important uh, you are required to do it within a very strict timeline of 15 days and once again please see just as in the case of the denials under the pleadings if you are denying a document in the admission denial also you are required to deny it on specific terms earlier the it you would simply say admitted or denied now if you are denying something or admitting something you are required to say what exactly are you doing are you doing it for correctness of contents or are you doing it qua existence are you doing it qua execution are you doing it qua issuance custody etc etc so therefore uh, it is specifically required now if you look at sub rule 3 that a party gives categorical reasons why it is electing to take a particular course of action even in the admission and denial and it is no longer open to you to give a vague statement and you know just hope that you can build on it later or explain it away later depending on how the case proceeds you would now have to be very clear of the case which you are setting up at the very initial stage now uh, also of course you will need an affidavit along with this so that the party is strictly bound down by it and obviously accountability also can be fixed and uh, as i mentioned if a court finds that the admission denial is something which is uh, effected in a pernicious manner or in an obstructive manner then obviously uh, there can be exemplary costs which may be imposed on the party which is actually indulged in this conduct and uh, even qua admitted documents uh, so as to ensure that as i mentioned to you sometimes affidavits in examination in chief are just copy pasted completely mechanical process to ensure that that is avoided the court may also pass orders with regard to admitted documents and how to uh, how the waiver of proof uh, thereon is to be construed now when it comes to a uh, production of documents um, uh, again that those strict timelines continue you are required to ask the court you you can ask the court to provide uh, production of any particular document from the counterparty but uh, again timelines are extremely strict once you give notice to the counterparty it is required to respond within a strict timeline and uh, if at all there is uh, no uh, compliance of the order made by the court then obviously the sufficient adverse inference can be drawn against the uh, defaulting party now uh, one important aspect which you again must uh, deal with is the electronic records because uh, under electronic records also there are specific requirements which have been put in place by the commercial courts act because the commercial courts act is more cognizant of and engages with the ever increasing amount of electronic evidence which is coming up before courts in civil disputes and therefore you know it puts in if i may call it a more practical form of uh, how to prove these documents or how to place them on record uh, in the sense of the process to be followed this is again something which you can look into in detail when you take a look at the uh, specific provision you can go through the rule the rule is comprehensive i am not dealing with in detail here because again we have a lot more ground to cover in terms of the commercial courts act 
Uh, essentially, this only seems to uh, uh, tries to simplify the process because under the normal circumstances of giving a 65 B affidavit, etc., under the Evidence Act, as applicable, say, to a normal civil suit, uh, the the law is a little it's not exactly categorical or very clear. So, therefore, the Commercial the Courts Act puts in place a specialized mechanism on how to deal with electronic evidence under its own ecosystem. Now, summary judgments. See, even under the CPC. Uh, as it stands today under order 8, there is a possibility, a theoretical possibility for a court to pronounce sub, uh, summary judgment. But the way in which the provision is worded, as also its subsequent interpretation by precedent, that avenue is very, very small. So, uh, it's a very, very small avenue for the court or a very limited avenue for the court to provide or to render summary judgment. And you will find a lot of cases where the appellate forum sets aside summary judgments on the ground that uh, they simply uh, went beyond the provision in the sense of uh, completely knocking out or non suiting a party, which would otherwise have been given the right to trial. So order uh, 13, I'm so sorry, not eight, order 13 of the CPC as it otherwise existed uh, and even order eight in the sense of uh, the, uh, the, the, the ability of a court not to frame an issue has now been significantly strengthened. And now the court has given explicit subjective power to determine if a summary judgment should be passed, if the plaintiff has no real prospect of succeeding or the defendant has no real prospect of successfully defending. This is very, very important because otherwise there are a lot of cases which ex facie without even having to delve into say oral evidence from the pleading itself, it becomes very clear that it's a completely frivolous litigation, either in terms of the prosecution or the defense. And therefore, now under Order 13, a court is fully empowered to knock out such a litigation at the very preliminary stage. Now, why this becomes very important from the perspective of a lawyer is, it is now even more important to uh, make the necessary pleadings or averments or draft your pleadings in a particular way. Because now the punishment is instant. If your pleadings are unable to make out even a modicum of a case, then you, your case or your defense will be thrown out summarily. Earlier councils as also parties had the luxury of their case evolving over time or putting in place a really bad pleading and then telling the court that, look, even if it's a bad pleading, I have a right to trial. So therefore you are entitled to, you know, prolong the litigation. You are entitled to necessarily take a party to trial. and you know, even if at all punishment came in the sense of dismissal of the case or of the defense, that punishment came much later in time. And by that time, you know, the, the, the rigmarole of the trial itself was enough of a punishment to the counterparty. But now if your case is weak, you don't understand what your case is, or if it's articulated poorly in your pleadings, you will face instant defeat. And you can no longer postpone the inevitable if actually your case is really poor. So very, very important change made to the civil uh, adjudication paradigm by this uh, in, uh, amendment by the Commercial Courts Act expressly permitting summary judgments based on an ex facie understanding or a prima facie understanding of the complete uh, hopelessness of a particular case or of a defense offered against a meritorious case. Now, uh, again, there are certain rules and regulations in the sense of how these applications are to be made, etc. Uh, one, of course, uh, if the suit is a summary suit under Order 37, then obviously the application will not lie because Order 37 by itself is a summary proceeding. And uh, obviously an application for summary judgment also must now contain certain basic parameters. These are put out here. You must contain a summary. What exactly are the facts which are important, the, which identify the point of law? If at all, there is any documentary evidence which is being relied upon. What is that, etc., etc. So these are the formal requirements which any application for summary judgment must fulfill before uh, it can be given effect to by the court concerned. Now, the applicant may rely on documentary evidence in support of its application, which is again important because under most of the summary proceedings under the erstwhile CPC or the unamended CPC, I'm sorry, uh, CPC is still around, uh, is something which uh, uh, you will uh, you could only have done by relying on the pleadings. For instance, under Order 7, Rule 11 of the CPC, which is one of the uh, rules which permit for rejection of uh, a suit for not, not lack of cause of action, etc. The law was that you could only rely on what was said in the plaint 
you could not rely on uh, let's say the, what was said in the written statement etc etc but uh, now beyond going beyond that this actually permits explicit reliance on documentary evidence which was not exactly the case in the uh, earlier scenario because otherwise the pleadings in the written statement under the unamended cpc were essentially relied on as a gospel truth and if despite believing what was said in the plaint uh, still no case was made out only then could you invoke order 7 rule 11 but the summary judgment uh, provision under the commercial courts act goes much further now the respondent also when responding to any such uh, application is required to be very specific he he or she cannot get away from uh, uh, let's say specifically dealing with what the application says and any sort of a vague denial or a uh, let's say evasive denial is not going to be taken into consideration or taken cognizance of by a court while actually adjudicating on the application now uh, as i mentioned to you uh, these are very very strict parameters uh, these are not really present under the unamended cpc or let's say under the standard civil system uh, and these are that in that way pretty novel now it's a different issue how much people are able to comply with this and what kind of a, uh, outlook the courts will have in the future in terms of condoning say imprecise pleadings etc but if you look at the recent history of adjudication under the commercial courts act you will notice that the courts have been extremely strict with uh, non compliance with these provisions and as i mentioned to you the general tenor seems to be that uh, if you don't meet these requirements too bad your case is deserving of being thrown out so please remember as lawyers now the onus is far higher on you because there is nothing uh, let's say more unfortunate than a meritorious case being chucked out of the uh, let's say the the system merely because you know you were ineffective in being able to take care of the procedural requirements see this is pretty harsh but unfortunately i think uh, this is sort of like a hammer blow to pendency parliament seems to have taken the view and the courts have agreed that uh, even if it means sacrificing a lot of meritorious cases ultimately they will go with the harsh uh, option or the harsh course of actually uh, throwing out all these cases summarily so that not only is pendency reduced but also it forces as a shock mechanism a substantive increase in the sophistication and professionalism of the manner of conducting civil litigation so as i mentioned those normal arguments that oh the client will suffer just because of the lawyer's fault you'll find a lot of judgments uh, erstwhile or the supreme court and the high court saying that clients should not be made to suffer or parties should not be made to suffer for a lawyer's fault but the commercial courts act does not make any such distinction if the lawyer fails to because client obviously can't do this, this is the lawyer's job if the lawyer fails to do this then too bad the case will suffer an untimely death and uh, there is really nothing you can do about it so i can't stress enough the uh, the requirement of ensuring fidelity to the requirements under the commercial courts act now uh, case management hearings this is another aspect of the uh, commercial courts act which is quite novel now see one of the problems with litigation in a country particularly civil litigation is frequent adjournments and uh, any sort of a lack of a scheduling now for instance uh, let's say the semester now you obviously will get say a semester schedule from the university saying this is when you will have let's say your surprise test your 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 mid semesters your end semesters project submissions if at all when you have to take your internships when does the semester formally end etc etc but in the case of a civil suit what do we usually do we take it as it comes so you file a civil suit it comes up before a court on the first date the court will issue notice give a next date on the next date somebody will turn up and from the defendant and say please let me file a written statement then a next date will be given and you know things go on depending on the uh, let's say the next date and what transpires thereon but uh, under the commercial courts act for the very first time after the filing of admission affidavits of admission denial the court will actually convene a case management hearing and once that case management hearing is convened the court is requested is required to put in place a schedule for the future conduct of the litigation all the way up to the oral submission stage and the act though of course it's extremely ambitious one of the good examples of uh, statutes in a country which are overtly optimistic that the arguments have to be closed within 6 months of the first case management hearing 
So effectively, in the case management hearing for the next six months, all the way up to closure of oral submissions, you are required, the court will put down a schedule saying two weeks from now, you will have your affidavits of examination in chief. Two weeks thereafter, this is when, these are the dates on which the cross-examination will happen. These are days on which the other side's cross-examination will happen. Finish. These are the days on which you may file a written synopsis of arguments. Finish. This is the last date on which you will address arguments before the court. Finish. So now the court at least textually is called upon to put in place such a schedule so as to ensure that the entire case is regimented and is uh, disposed of in terms of a schedule. But please bear in mind, unfortunately, as is the case with almost all such expedited provisions, the effectiveness of this depends on the kind of infrastructure you have available. It is uh, obviously a fool's paradise to believe that if in a court there are 50 or 60 cases pending before a judge, how practical is it for that particular commercial court to be able to adhere to something like this? It is humanly impossible. So which is one of my, let's say, disagreements with the kind of changes which the Commercial Courts Act seeks to bring about. It's something I'm working on also from an academic perspective. That as to how even though normatively the Commercial Courts Act is revolutionary, unfortunately on the ground level, a lot of its intended effects will never take place because you simply haven't done enough to augment resources to actually be able to achieve the lofty ideals of what the Act really uh, tries to put into place. Anyway, that's a uh, discussion for a different day. But anyway, at least textually, these case management hearings are required to be adhered to strictly. And this is again something that you need to factor in, in terms of your schedule as a lawyer. Now, uh, again, uh, under there is an amendment again to provisions of the CPC, which now expressly require parties uh, to submit distinct and concise written arguments in support of their case. This is like a very uh, significant formalization of the process of filing written arguments expressly requiring parties to now put them on the record in or around the time when the uh, oral arguments are uh, started. And this is again something which is again regimented in the sense of what exactly is required under these written submissions being specifically provided for by the Commercial Courts Act. And uh, this obviously is again a significant change because in our, in, at least in our litigation system, written statements have usually been weighed as more of, let's say, convenience uh, as a tool of convenience, which certain courts ask for, certain judges ask for, and certain judges don't. So this now formalizes the process and requires parties to put in place written submissions mandatorily. And I believe it's a good step, positive step, because this avoids the controversy which frequently arises when before the appellate forum, it is urged that a point specifically urged before the original court was not considered by the original court. So now when you have the provision of written submissions, at least it's very clear on the record for the appellate court also as to what exactly are the points which were argued by the parties at the stage of the final oral arguments. And again, there, it is obviously going to be open to a court as this rule provides that uh, uh, the court may limit the time for oral submissions, having regard to the nature and complexity of the matter. But this anyway was an inherent power, which was even otherwise available to the courts. But now it's formalized so that there can be no allegation of, say, any sort of a, uh, ad hoc uh, reduction in time or something of that effect. Now, uh, another important aspect which you must uh, keep in mind is that uh, under uh, there is another uh, amendment which also requires that the affidavits should uh, be led by a party shall be filed simultaneously. So earlier, you know, there was this concept where sometimes parties staggered the filings, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That is no longer permissible. And uh, they shall, there shall be no permission to lead additional affidavits by an affidavit unless sufficient cause is made out in an application for that purpose. Most importantly, under 1C, the party shall have the right to withdraw any of the affidavits at any time prior to commencement of the cross-examination. See, earlier the problem used to be that parties, just so that not to take a chance, would file umpteen number of affidavits, particularly defendants. Now, let's say the defendant's lawyer cross-examines the witness of the plaintiff and he or she is able to extract, say, admissions or any contradictions in the witnesses of the plaintiff, which actually fulfill the role which the defendant's witness was otherwise required to discharge. So now the provision specifically permits you to withdraw those witnesses 
whose affidavits you may otherwise have filed. This is important because otherwise most parties were reluctant to withdraw these witnesses because it was thought that a withdrawal will mean a uh, you know something which was done in a a manner which will prejudice the party concerned so earlier there was some inertia with regard to withdrawing witness affidavits once filed because you know of the lack of say an express provision like this which specifically permitted you to do that so that also is good because now it permits a withdrawal of affidavits which have now become to a large extent academic in nature because of say some supervening circumstances and without any stigma in that regard or any prejudice a party is now permitted to go ahead and do the need for now uh, to conclude uh, there is also a significant amendment but once again something which i believe is quite utopian that uh, a judgment once reserved shall be pronounced within 90 days of conclusion of arguments see ultimately what happens is one one thing you must realize is almost all of these mandatory provisions in terms of timelines which put an onus on the court have largely been read by the applicable precedent to not be mandatory in nature so please understand mandatory timelines which are applicable to litigants are strictly enforced but timelines which require the court concerned to let's say render judgment or conclude a trial have largely been held to be only directory in nature and not mandatory now while this does seem a little strange the practical reason for that is as i mentioned to you that uh, unfortunately in our country when we put in place ambitious statutes there is never really any sort of a study done in terms of its impact assessment on the requirements for the judiciary in terms of augmentation of resources so overnight if you let's say you set up a new ecosystem and you flood thousands and lakhs of cases into it but you don't do anything in terms of creation of posts for judges additional judges or creating the requisite infrastructure in the sense of creating new court rooms etc then you are stuck with this very old adage that it's essentially a case of uh, old wine in a new bottle so uh, one problem with the commercial courts act going forward is only going to be this that uh, there is a significant mismatch between what our resources permit and what the act expects us to do in terms of the timeline for the proceedings now unfortunately for you as lawyers uh, lack of resources or lack of understanding is not a ground you can take in terms of when you represent your client when you haven't adhered to any of these mandatory timelines or processes and therefore dehors the debate of whether this is too ambitious is the act too utopian in terms of what it seeks to bring about as lawyers you have no option but to fall in line so uh, the reason again why i'm stressing on this is because even for somebody say who's only had a decade in the profession uh, when the commercial courts act actually started getting implemented after its uh, after it got passed in the year 2015 it was very very difficult as a practitioner to be actually able to take into account all these radical changes and even now i will get briefs from solicitors where uh, some applications been filed by the counterparty and on going through the written statement or the plaint as the case may be i find that uh, there is a complete deviation from what the commercial courts act required and what the plaint or written statement has and uh, you know it creates a lot of difficulty in being able to actually defend that particular litigation in court uh, because for the from the judge concerned uh, when questions are asked in terms of fidelity to the commercial court act there is very little to respond to uh, if there is clearly textual non compliance with the requirements enshrined therein so all i want to point out is that uh, this is again a new or a very let's say radical uh, form of litigation and uh, even if you are interning in an office or if you are a fresher in a litigation firm uh there is a lot which you can contribute in terms of value addition if you are well aware of the requirements of the uh, commercial court act because a lot of the responses to litigation whether it is in the form of written statements or plaints etc they are very stereotypical in nature because we are ingrained with them because over a period of time we have been taught that this is the normal and therefore adjusting to the new normal is difficult for a lot of practitioners so please bear this in mind and uh, in fact what are the practical consequences what how exactly is this taking place on the ground level you will get a detailed uh, uh, discussion a much more detailed discussion in the video which i had shared so for all of you who are interested in that sense you can go through it otherwise this slide uh, to that extent does cover most of the major amendments which the commercial court act seeks to bring about but but again my advice to you would be please read the text of the commercial court act in the entirety a to z at least once so that 
you are very clear in terms of what is the new system or the new mechanism which it seeks to uh, put into place. So uh, that is it from me in as far as what the Commercial Courts Act contemplates and the kind of regime which uh, it seeks to put uh, into effect. And uh, if there are any queries in terms of uh, the procedure or the law in terms of the Commercial Courts Act, uh, you can please let me know. Yeah, so from Ankush. Yeah, so see, as far as the, yeah, this is a pertinent question in relation to the e-filing features. See, as far as e-filing is concerned, uh, Ankush, uh, are you referring, if I take it correctly, to the actual process of filing a pleading electronically? Or are you referring to the electronic evidence? If you could just clarify, I think the question is, yeah, the question is a reference to the pleadings. Absolutely. So see, as far as the e-filing qua the pleadings is concerned, I don't think it represents such a gigantic shift, especially if you are practicing before a court or a tribunal, which all along had, uh, let's say, e-filing in place. To give you a practical example, uh, the High Court of Delhi had in fact started e-filing much prior in time, at least for certain jurisdictions, say the company court or say the arbitration roster. So ultimately, the e-filing is more a manner of uh, the logistics of actually undertaking the process because all the formal requirements remain the same, whether you are e-filing or you're physically filing. But yeah, e-filing practically in terms of the implications which you are asking for does have significant implications. Uh, because, for instance, if you are, let's say, e-filing the index or if you are, let's say, e-filing the documents, a lot of the uh, court systems or the court rules will require you to file a bookmarked file. So that adds another step or another layer to what is required of you to ensure that there are no defects in your filing. Now, as I mentioned to you, if you're on a very strict line, say a strict timeline, say in terms of filing a written statement or filing, say, a replication, then evidently you need to ensure that your filing is without any defects. Now, in e-filing creates an entirely new range of complications because you may have, say, indexes which are not bookmarked. Now, imagine bookmarking a gigantic index. It's, it's a lot of work. And uh, in the case of physical filing, you wouldn't have to worry about that because once you're done with your index, that's it. Take a printout and you sign it and you file it in court. So one, in terms of what you are required to do technically, there is there are a lot of challenges. Uh, also, let's say if you're doing e-filing, your court fees, usually you'll go buy a court fee physically, affix it on the, uh, let's say, the plaint. But in the case of e-filing, many a times you are required to say, download the particular certificate in a virtual fashion and uh, then actually have that certificate put in place by, uh, you know, the, by the particular, by the particular, you know, let's say, uh, let's say the format or methodology, which may actually be required. Okay. And uh, then the other thing uh, which you need to bear in mind also when you are doing an e-filing is that uh, there is a specific requirement under a lot of these e-filing, uh, let's say, methods in terms of how you structure your pleadings. For instance, as I mentioned, the rule that they must only be, say, 200 pages in a volume, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So these are all, let's say, specific to the rules which are applicable to that particular court or forum which you might be practicing before. So logistically, yes, it is a significant burden. And if you don't follow those particular uh, norms or guidelines, then effectively you are tasked or maybe you are confronted with the position that your filing is a defective or ineffectual filing. So that is something that you need to be careful about in terms of the practical implications. Uh, right now from Priyanka, keeping in mind. Yeah, so right. So therefore, this is a very interesting question. In fact, uh, so this is again what I was working on. Uh, See, after the Commercial Courts Act has come into play, uh, there are a lot of opinions from practitioners that the Commercial Courts Act is in fact better suited uh, to for an effective and quick adjudication of disputes as compared to the Arbitration Act. Now, uh, the reason, as I mentioned to you, why I am not a votary of this view is because I believe considering the shortage of infrastructure uh, which the judiciary has, Commercial Courts Act, even though have a very lofty ideal, they will not be able to live up to that promise in the strict sense. But uh, as you mentioned, if you are somebody as a party or as in a matter of strategy, you do not want, say, to be subjected to the strict timelines and guidelines under the Commercial Courts Act, then evidently 
you uh, arbitration is a good option because as we will deal with when we come to the specific uh, sessions under the arbitration act uh, the arbitration act gives you a lot of flexibility it gives you a lot of customizability in terms of how you want to proceed with the adjudication of your disputes so naturally even though after the amendments to the arbitration act in the year 2015 arbitration also has now become much stricter in terms of timelines as compared to how it was earlier evidently the options available to you or the scope available to you to have let's say a more enlarged period of time to comply with actions or directions as may be passed by the arbitral tribunal is much wider under the arbitration act as compared to say the commercial courts act so definitely if you want more flexibility if you want greater scope in terms of being able to enlarge the timeline uh, for the individual stages definitely arbitration will give you far greater customizability uh, in 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 these terms so yeah definitely right so uh, so it, it's a good good way to end the session because now again in the next two sessions we will primarily be dealing with uh, how uh, arbitration uh, you know essentially constitutes a distinct limb of uh, the civil adjudication process and what are the similarities and differences between whatever we have spoken of so far and uh, in terms of uh, hard hardcore or stereotypical litigation as opposed to arbitration and uh, ultimately you will come to see that in fact the similarities between a litigation process and an arbitration process will be far greater than what you would have been led to believe uh, once you read the standard literature around arbitration so that we will look at in the next two sessions we will segregate it in terms of the hardcore procedural requirements under the arbitration act as opposed to the more substantive uh, nature of the law in relation to certain aspects so that is what we will be dealing with in the class uh, day after tomorrow and uh, i i will speak to professor dhanda in terms of how the projects will pan out i haven't been able to speak to her so far so i will let you guys know about that uh, as soon as possible so uh, that's it from me from today so i will see you guys day after okay. thanks a lot